Please turn the mic. 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 Well, you already sat down. I was going to tell you you could sit. Uh, my name is Diana Thorburn, and you'll hear more from me later. But for now, I'm going to hand over to our board chair, Mr. Anton Thompson, to begin the evening's proceedings. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, men. Um, welcome to Campion College for this year's annual Archbishop Samuel Carter Lecture. We're very honored to have each and every one of you here this afternoon. I'd like to especially welcome, first of all, His Grace Archbishop Kenneth Richards, the Archbishop of Kingston, also representing the, the Archbishop Samuel Carter Foundation, um, Ambassador, Her Excellency Ambassador Alun Asamba, um, and also specially welcoming, and, and any other members of the directors of the foundation who are here, I'd like to welcome them as well. Um, also want to specially welcome the previous present presenters of this lecture who are with us, um, Professor Errol Miller, Reverend Peter Espute, Reverend Birchell Taylor. Um, I don't know if I see any of the others here this afternoon. Welcome all of you to, to this function. We want to especially welcome the principal of Campion College, Mrs. Grace Baston, and who is, the, who is chief in organizing this function. We want to um, welcome her, the vice principal, uh, Mr. David Henry, and the acting vice principal, Ms. Catherine Stewart, the other members of staff of Campion who have all contributed in some way to this evening's program. Want to mention, welcome all the students who have come out and other members of the Campion community. Welcome all of you to this, to this occasion. Campion College was founded over 60 years ago by the Jesuit fathers. And any good school, any good institution in Jamaica is not only about its core function. It's about much more. And the fact is that Part of that function is to ensure that we impact the wider community. These lectures, which we've been having for some years, are part of that, are part of that, ensuring that we're impacting the wider community by giving an opportunity for the, the persons of, 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 of knowledge, persons of experience to share in this forum and as we are being streamed to wider parts of, of Jamaica and the world ideas about where we stand on common problems and also reflections on what has taken place in the past. We've been very blessed to have some excellent presenters. And this afternoon, we are no, we are no less blessed in having um, Professor Michael Taylor, who is the Dean of the Faculty of Science and Technology. I have to look at it to make sure I have it correct. Dean of the Fac at the University of the West Indies, Mona. Professor Taylor is a alumnus of Campion. He's not the first alumnus who has done this lecture, but he's, we're very proud to have him here as an alumnus. And also because of his position, I think many of the deans at the UE Mona who are Jamaicans are all Campion graduates. So that's a, something that we have made, made, made a contribution to the society in. So we, we, we look forward to hearing from Professor Taylor um, shortly. And just before I turn over, because you, you didn't come here to hear me, I need to inform you that if you need the restrooms, they are in the building across, okay? The way um, these restrooms in this building are currently under repair. So if you need to use the restroom, they're in the building across the way, the building just to the north of us, the old Roslyn Hall building. And they're, they'll be relatively easy for you to find them. Okay, so with that, I'm going to ask Archbishop Richards to come and say a prayer for us. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Good evening, all. All protocols have been observed. Uh, the value of this evening is so important. You know, there is a quote from the scriptures in Ecclesiastes that, that, that some men live in such a way that it's as if they had never passed this way, but others have left a legacy behind. And indeed, this evening, we gather to honor the legacy of Archbishop Samuel Carter and these 
lecture series, I've been just doing, doing just that. And especially for all of us, but indeed the young ones is an opportunity for us to recognize the importance that we remember the past and the contribution that others have, have made. There's a quote from Billy Graham that indicates that the best legacy that one can pass on is not money or, or material things, but faith and, and character. And if you lose character, you lose everything. And so indeed, it's good that we have so many young persons here today, but indeed, this evening's and the lecture series can be of benefit for all of us to contemplate legacy and even contemplate the legacy that we will leave behind so that in such a way that we live our life to impact others and society. Let us pray. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Merciful God, we bless your holy name. And as we begin this new year, 2023, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the past year for all that we were able to achieve. And we ask mercy for the missed opportunities. We pray that your Holy Spirit will truly be present in this evening's presentation to guide Dr. Michael Taylor to our own minds so that it will be an experience so that through his presentation, we'll have a deepening of faith, true faith, that indeed we understand the true meaning of things in relationship to God, that indeed we'll have a firm hope that indeed values and as we reflect on the legacy of others that is important for the advancement of society and that can be an inspiration for our lives. So Lord, send forth your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and our minds for the interaction this evening that would be a benefit of all. We continue to ask for, to bless the repose of the soul, grant eternal rest to Archbishop Samuel, Samuel Carter. We thank you, Lord, for the life that he lived and the contribution that he made to our society and the Catholic Church. Hear, Lord, our prayer and grant your mercies as we invite your presence this evening for this lecture series. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You want me to hold the mic for you? Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. I am so happy to be here on behalf of the trustees of the Archbishop Samuel E. Carter SJ Foundation. I was asked to do this task by the most Reverend Archbishop Emeritus Don Rees, who is off the island. I speak on behalf of the other trustees and they are most Reverend Donald Rees, who is the chairman of the board, the most Reverend Kenneth Richards, Archbishop of Kingston, Mrs. Grace Baston, Principal of Campion College and Vice Chairman, Mrs. Andrea Hitchner, high school teacher at ICHS and the first Carter Fellow, Mrs. Hazel Keating, Principal Emeritus of St. Joseph Teachers College. She's the Assistant Secretary of the Board. The Most Reverend Burchell McPherson, Bishop of Montego Bay. Mrs. Maureen O'Connor, Management Consultant. Dr. Anna Perkins, Professor and UWI Administrator. Professor Swithin Wilmot, Dean Emeritus of UWI. Mrs. Colleen Vendry's attorney at law, Professor Joseph Woolcock, who is secretary of the board and who lives abroad and is very involved in the board. I use this opportunity to reflect a bit on Archbishop Carter. He entered the Society of Jesus in August 1944 and was ordained a priest on June 19, 1954. He was appointed Archbishop of Kingston on September 25th, 1970, and he retired in January of 1995. 
after studying abroad and he was absent from Jamaica for 14 years, he was appointed assistant priest at Holy Trinity Cathedral. And in the summer of 1959, he was invited to be the first headmaster of Campion College, a new Jesuit high school for boys. And he remained in this post until 1964, when he became the first rector of St. George's College. He became the first Jamaican Roman Catholic Bishop when he was appointed Auxiliary Bishop to Bishop McElhaney. This was after he had served as Vicar General and Pastor of Holy Cross Church for four years. So in 1970, he became the first Archbishop of Kingston. He was very active in the Antilles Episcopal Conference and served six consecutive terms from 1968 to 1980, and again from 1983 to 1981. There is a long list of the many organizations and commissions he participated in. But my greatest memory of him is how he democratized the church in Jamaica. With the institution of the first Roman Catholic Synod to get lay people more involved in the work of the church. And he set up various bodies in the archdiocese and the parishes. He was a very great supporter of the Catholic youth movement. And I see my good friend Peter here and Anton. And if I could see a little bit more, I probably will see others. He supported us greatly. Archbishop Ken, I beg your pardon. You were part of that group too. <laughs> he was a little younger than us, yes, but still there. He was a great supporter of the youth and he backed us when many parish priests wanted to throw us out of the church because they were not used to the young people taking active part in the church. He also supported the use of Jamaican music in the Catholic church, something that we now take for granted and we believe that this is what it always was. It was not. He was joyful to ordain during his time, 27 priests and 20 deacons of the permanent diaconate. He also ordained some bishops. I have a personal, I have so many personal stories with the Archbishop. He was a man who supported education all his life. He was a strong participant in education and social justice issues. I remember him being very active in the Jamaica Council of Churches and the Caribbean Council of Churches in those areas. The foundation has sought to carry on his work in education by awarding scholarships for further education of Catholic teachers and the institution of this memorial lecture in his honor. His motto, that all may be done, is more than ever, a, that all may be one, sorry, is more than ever a cry that we must heed today. Thank you for coming and please enjoy this evening's lecture. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Ms. Armstrong and your students. I happen to know that they started those pieces on Tuesday and the national anthem pieces. So please give them another round of applause. They did an outstanding job. Research, said Zora Neale Hurston, is formalized curiosity and curiosity is what guarantees our survival. Good evening, my name is Diana Thorburn and I have the honor and privilege of introducing our guest speaker and moderating the Q&A which will follow his presentation. 
Before I get into the introduction, I want to introduce you all to a little bit of technology that we're going to be using for the Q&A. And I will repeat this again, but I just want to sensitize you. We're going to be using something called Slido. So on your phone or whatever device you have, you're going to go to slido.com and you're going to enter the event code CAMPION. And there you can post questions and or you can vote up questions that other people have posted that you would like to see answered. So when I'm sitting there with Professor Taylor, I will see the questions that are the most popular at the top of the pile. And I will know that that's the one that people really want to, to get asked. So I'm not going to be taking any questions from the audience. So if you don't have a device, try and get the person beside you to post your question for you. Ready? Almost ready. Slido.com, yes, S-L-I-D-O.com. And you can even, the beauty of it is you can post questions while you're thinking of them as he's uh, giving his presentation. But of course, you must listen to the presentation as well, right? Okay, all right. Our guest speaker for the 2023 annual Archbishop Samuel Carter lecture has said he would like to be thought of as a lecturer who loves his students and a researcher who is passionate about his research. For Professor Michael Taylor, curiosity has led him to research issues and topics that are quite literally related to our survival as a species and a planet, and specifically the impact of climate change in the Caribbean. Michael Taylor is Professor of Climate Science and Dean of the Faculty of Science and Technology at UWI Mono. His research has contributed to fundamental theories on Caribbean climate variability, and his work is widely published and frequently cited. He's a co-director of the Climate Studies Group Mono and a coordinating lead author on the special report on 1.5 degrees of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. His work as a climate scientist has been celebrated and recognized through the awards bestowed on him nationally and internationally. He's a Silver Musgrave Awardee for Science and the 2019 ANSA Caribbean Laureate for Excellence in Science. In 2021, he was named one of Apolitical's 100 most influential academics in government globally. He most recently authored a chapter in Greta Thunberg's The Climate Book, so he has some cred. I think it might be appropriate here to mention that Taylor, Professor Taylor's academic foundation was laid right here at Campion College. I won't say what class he was, but I was class of 87 and he was in my year. And I should also maybe say that we all thought he was going to go into the church and clearly he didn't go down that path. And one more fun fact, we were the first class to graduate from this auditorium. <laughs> From, from here, he got a first class honors in general environmental physics from the UWI and a master's and PhD from the University of Maryland. This evening, however, we will not be hearing about climate variability or the environment. Instead, we have the privilege of Professor Taylor sharing with us a new line of research where his curiosity and outstanding mind have led him, a new area. I'm not worried though. I heard him speak at our daughter's fifth form graduation last June. To be clear, he has a daughter and I have a daughter, two different people. Uh, <laughs> his daughter is now in sixth form, mine is in the UK. <laughs> his keynote was the first graduation speech I have ever listened to beginning to end, including graduation speeches at my own graduations over the years. It was funny, interesting and inspiring. And I have thought about it often since. So I'm keen to hear about changing the lingo from IDC to OBO, and you should be too. He wouldn't tell us what the acronyms stand for, but I had some insider information. It has something to do with change and with community. I have no doubt that we will leave here better off for having been privy to his thoughts. I will stop talking and let him do his thing.
Good evening. This lecture is inspired by William and dedicated to my family. I'm going to adopt all protocols and simply acknowledge staff, student, students, parents, associates, past lecturers, friends, everybody here this evening. Let me begin by thanking the Campion family for inviting me to do this lecture. I confess I did not readily say yes. I did not readily say yes because I'm at the stage of parenting when roles are reversed and it is now I who get a serious sit-down lecture from my child about embarrassing them in public. Well, as an over-enthusiastic scientist who relishes the opportunity to throw in a few equations whenever I have a captive audience for a lecture, it quickly came to mind when initially asked that my speaking at my child's grad school, I would be flirting with the risk of being severely reprimanded by her. So for, if your head start to nod or halfway through this lecture, your chairs all become empty because suddenly you have the urge to go to the bathroom I cannot go home tonight. So I did not readily say yes. But the second and more important reason I hesitated was because this is the Archbishop Samuel Carter lecture. Even if you didn't know the man, quickly Googling him throws up phrases like one who holds a hallowed place in Jamaica's history, a colossal figure, leading ecumenist, an outspoken advocate for the poor, a proponent of social justice, a pioneer in the pursuit of holistic quality edu education for all, a man for all people and all seasons. The legacy of the most reverend, the honorable Samuel Carter is such that to even consider delivering a lecture in his honor is a run to the hills in intimidating idea. And it doesn't help that the list of previous lecturers, many of them are here. Reverend Ronald Thwaites, Professor Trevor Monroe, Professor Errol Miller, Reverend Peter Espute, and yes, my own father, Reverend the Honorable Birchell Taylor. I confess that when asked, I did not readily say yes. But Mrs. Baston has a way to charm and convince, doesn't she? And so I, here I am. However, I will ask you not to hold the inevitable inadequacies of this lecture against Mrs. Baston, particularly because I'm warning you already, I'm going to deviate from the regular lecture format. I'm also relying on your graciousness, a quality imbued by Campion and all those associated with the institution. And I'm also relying on the admonition of Mrs. Baston and Miss Stewart to their, her class, to their classes to at least look interested in what the man is saying. So I start this lecture by assuring you that IDC and OBO are not scientific acronyms. And this evening, there will be no science jargon or well, maybe just a little, but definitely no equations. This evening, what I want to talk to you about is service, S-E-R-V-I-C-E, -E, service. What on earth does this have to do with the title, changing the lingo from IDC to OBO? Well, for now, I ask you to stay with me as I offer context, build out a short thesis, and by the end, fingers crossed, make the association clear. In this lecture, I will not try to make a case for the value of service. I think that is a given, and there are very few persons, if any here tonight, who would dispute that. The very nature of what service is, acts of helping, acts of helping means that the end result of service is improvement and betterment. So, for example, in the context of society, service builds community by connecting the servant and the served. Service provides opportunities for fulfilling civic roles. Didn't you hear the director of public prosecution this week as she opined about the inability to find jurors? Service protects the most vulnerable service establishes worth and restores dignity and if service does all that in a society then service also helps with nation building do any of you remember the first line of the national pledge hmm that's a problem <laughs> try say it with me before God and all mankind, I pledge the love and loyalty of my heart, the wisdom and courage of my mind, the strength and vigor of my body in the 
service of my fellow citizens. Not to be missed in that line is that it is a giving of the whole self in service that is critical. It is a heart, mind, and body pledged in service that helps advance the welfare of the whole human race. This evening, I start then with the assumption that there is no dispute whatsoever about the value of self-giving service. And yet, if that is so, it is extremely concerning to me that not with this, notwithstanding its indisputable value, self-giving service is not as highly prized or prioritized in our society today. Certainly not to the, to the same extent that led to it being written into our national pledge and other patriotic songs. Think of, I pledge my heart forever to serve with humble pride. Or, Jamaica land of beauty, I promise faithfully to serve thee with my talents. Compare that to today. When was the last, what was the last dance hall tune you know that paid ode to self-giving service? Well, I checked the top three on last week's hot singles chart. No mention of self-giving service in Don's Check by Valiant. No mention of self-giving service in Idiot by Skeng and Jigsta. And no mention of self-giving service in Feisty by, or is that Feisty by Massacre. But neither is self-giving service on the lips of our leaders in society, except every now and then when volunteerism rears its head. And it is hardly ever the headline story in the newspaper or on the evening news. In our society today, the prevalence of self-giving service seems to be decreasing. It is not overtly evident, not consistently spoken of, nor is it routinely pursued on any large scale. In fact, I would argue that when we hear the word service today, our first association is less and less with a helping act and more and more with a transactional based action. I give you service in exchange for payment. This evening, I want to use this opportunity of this lecture to enlist you all in what I call a service restoration campaign. One which seeks to reverse a trend and one which one, and once again makes self-giving service a priority in our society. But we have to first ask ourselves, why is the prevalence of self-giving service decreasing in our society today? And therein lies the focus of my lecture this evening. I think it is more than just mere forgetting to engage in it that is causing the decrease. Rather, I want to put forward a scientific theory. I couldn't get away with it. <laughs> Sorry. I am contending that there are some new ailments in our society today, which once we have caught them, impair some important tendencies in us that we need to facilitate self-giving service. Let me say that again. My scientific diagnostic abilities tell me that there are some new ailments circulating in our society today, three of them in fact, which once you catch them, impair critical tendencies in you that would otherwise facilitate self-giving service. How do you catch these ailments? You catch them from, through exposure to some emerging ethoses in society today. And as more and more people are exposed to these ethoses, more and more people are falling prey to these three ailments. And the result is a decreasing prevalence of self-giving service. What do I want to do with the rest of this lecture then? Won't be too long. Nothing more than share the three new ailments attacking self-giving service and the ethos driving each. I am doing this so you can become vigilant and prevent infection by these ailments and seek treatment for these ailments. And speaking of treatment, for each ailment, I will also quickly share the prescribed antidote. For you see, once I've made you aware and I have given you the antidote, I will have enlisted you in my service restoration campaign, making you a partner in reestablishing self-giving service as a priority in our society. And what does all this have to do with changing the lingo from IDC to IBO? Bear with me a little longer. So, 
what are these new three new ailments I am contending are circulating in society and attacking self-giving service? Ready? No, the nodding heads, I can't go home. Ready? All right. Ailment number one, Iopsia. Iopsia. What is this Iopsia that I am talking about? A gradual blinding to the need for service brought on by an increasing spread of self-centeredness. Iopsia. There is, an there is an unmistakable growing ethos of self-centeredness taking over our society. It is in part fueled by the permeation of ideologies that promote self-prioritization. So phrases like the following are now extremely common. You are your number one, or put yourself at the top of your to-do list every day and the rest will fall in place, or don't hate on yourself, or you have to practice self-rescue first before you can help someone else. These messages bombard us from every direction. So for example, they form the basis of ads for things like soul locations. If you don't know what that means, it's a solo vacation. I had to look it up. And the numerous self-care products on the market. The messages are part of the reason for the growth and proliferation of motivational speeches and self-actualization workshops. And the messages are to be found in what we read, the videos we watch, and the, the, the songs we listen to. Just check out Love Myself by Haley Steinfeld. I'm gonna put my body first and love me so hard till it hurts. I know how to scream out the words, scream out. Anyway, I think you get the idea. But let me quickly add that self-prioritization does have benefits. For example, it benefits confidence and, and, and it engenders confidence. Other theories suggest it can also boost your productivity, reduce stress and anxiety, and even improve your relationship, improve your relationship with others, especially your significant other, they say. The danger, however, with the I first ideology is that there is a blurry line which can be crossed, which shifts it from being about self prioritization to a promotion of self centeredness. And I think this line has been crossed in many of the bombarding messages and instances in society today. Hence, the increasing exposure by all of us to the ethos of self centeredness. And that is when I argue. I opsia, a gradual blinding to the need for service brought on by the increasing spread of self-centeredness has the opportunity to take hold. I opsia has COVID-like properties. One, it's easy to catch due to the endemicity of the causative vectors. In this case, easy to slip from self-focused care to self-centeredness due to the perversiveness of the bombarding messages. Two, it's not so easy to ascertain the exact point at which you have caught iopsia. In this case, the morphing from, from self-prioritization to self-centeredness is gradual, hence I that is why iopsia is so dangerous and the need for constant vigilance. And three, it's, you, it's usually only diagnosable after the symptoms have already begun overtaking the normal functioning of the afflicted. In this case, you know when iopsia has taken root because of its increasingly detrimental impact on your self-giving service. Increasing self-centeredness, I am suggesting, is an enemy of self-giving service. But what does increasing self-centeredness do at all? Firstly, in its way, self-giving service starts to be left behind. Self-centeredness makes self-prioritization the number one priority activity. And so nothing else can have a comparable place of importance. So when you start to attend the key club or ministry outreach or interact every other week instead of every week, there's a gradual diminishing of your self-giving service. Eventually, however, self-giving service doesn't just start to be left behind but it then starts to get what's left behind. Self-giving service starts to compete for the what left 
after you have a portion of the lion's share of your resources for your self-focused activities, which you see as more important. So after your Amazon purchases, after your twice weekly hairdresser appointments, or after the installation of yet another new gadget or app on your car or phone, and if the progression continues, then from left behind to getting what's left behind, eventually self-giving service gets left out. Because whether deliberately or inadvertently, your focus has to so shifted to you that you can't see the needs around you. At that point, self-giving service is no longer a feature of your daily living. Put it another way, increasing self-centeredness whittles away at your sensitivity to others, an important tendency needed for self-giving service. So how will we all know when IOPSIA, that gradual blinding to the need for service brought on by the increasing spread of self-centeredness has taken hold of us? We will know by examining our ability to see need. But it would be wrong of me to leave it there. Is there an antidote to IOPSIA, that gradual blinding to need brought on by the increasing spread of self-centeredness? Yes, it is early inoculation with and regular reinforcement of something boosters the concept of the other's interest as a society we counteract the impact of self-centeredness by deliberately inculcating from a young age and then reinforcing through constant alternative messaging the idea of generosity we must become assertive about recognizing and bigging up generosity as a virtue so that it becomes second nature to every one of us. For generosity allows for the other's interest to be on par or even exceed my interest. This is the importance of community service hours and service clubs and missionary church activities. Constant exposure to the concept of the other's interest heightens our capacity to be sensitive to others and therefore counteracts the spread of iopsia. So, as my newly recruited agents of change, in my operation service restoration, I'm asking you to be on the lookout for ailment number one spreading throughout our society. That ailment is IOPSIA, a gradual blinding to the need for service brought on by the increasing spread of self-centeredness. Self-centeredness diminishes our sensitivity to others by allowing self-focused living to replace self-giving service. Watch out for iopsium. Well, what is ailment number two? I said there were three ailments. Well, you mustn't only look out for iopsia, a gradual blinding to the need for service brought on by the increasing spread of self-centeredness but we have to be equally vigilant about ailment number two. What is ailment number two? It is deritis. A narrowing constriction preventing acts of service brought on by an inflamed sense of entitlement, self-entitlement, deritis. No. Not only is there an unmistakable rise in self-centeredness in society, there's also un unmistakably a growing ethos of self-entitlement in society today, which is also negatively impacting self-giving service. Whereas the rise in self-centeredness is being fueled by ideologies that promote self-prioritization, the rise in self-entitlement is being fueled by ideologies that pro actually promote entitlement. So most of these are common refrains now. Yes, but I have the right to. Or, but I am entitled to exercise my rights. Or, 
As long as I'm not doing anything illegal, I am free to do what I want, and there shouldn't be any problem with that. The ideology of entitlement is very evident in our society today. Like with self-prioritization versus self-centeredness, there is a bit of a blurry line issue here with respect to the prevalence of entitlement ideologies and the emergence of a self-entitlement ethos. You see, the idea of entitlement has some clear positives. For example, it ensures that no one is deprived of certain minimum or basic sets of benefits which are necessary for, for, for everyday living. That's entitlement. However, an awareness of entitlement can easily morph into an ethos of self-entitlement if the messages that bombard are too loosely crafted. Here is the distinction in my mind. I am contending that self-entitlement pushes the entitlement philosophy just a little bit further by saying, I have earned the right to do as I please. And so as long as it's not criminal, I have no obligation to anybody else but myself. When this becomes the mindset, then the rightitis has set in. And it is the growing pervasiveness of the self-entitlement ethos in society, which I suggest is posing a significant threat to self-giving service. What is a challenge with self-entitlement? In the way I'm defining it, self-entitlement, like entitlement, ponders to the idea that if it is allowable, it is permissible. But self-entitlement adds the caveat especially if I contributed to the wherewithal to make it possible. Perhaps some of the clearest examples of how this becomes a danger to self-giving service can be seen in the human response to climate change and the environment in general. See, again, I managed to slip in a little bit of it there. So, see if you recognize these, the feeling is, I have worked hard to be able to drive the largest gas guzzling vehicle possible on the earth. There is no law to prevent me from driving it anywhere and everywhere I want and for driving in comfort. What is not being said, what is implicit in that statement is, even if it means I contribute to greenhouse gas emissions and the problem of climate change for the present and future generation, no matter, I have the right to. Or the flip side of that is, think of, see if you know this one, I can free up my money to do other things for me if I go the less expensive route of using plastic over other biodegradable options. As long as I stick within the law about what size plastic is allowable. What is not being said in there is this, notwithstanding that on disintegration, the microplastics will eventually reach the sea and harm the marine ecosystem. But no matter, I have the right to. Or one more. At another level, you often hear this. We are the elected government. So we have earned the power to give permission to clear crown lands and to concrete it over, and I'm not talking about Devon House, and to erect multi storied monstrous, I mean, sorry, multi storied housing. What is not being said is this even if it had, sorry, what is not being said is this even if it necessitates giving, getting rid of grass or a few plants, a few lizards or a few birds, or diverting the natural flow of the stream on the property into a gully and away from the communities that previously had access to it. No matter, we have the right to do it. What does an inflamed sense of self-entitlement do? Inflamed self-entitlement makes you feel comfortable with the fact that there is no obligation to deprive oneself of what is rightfully yours for the sake of others. There is no obligation to inconvenience oneself by limiting use of what is rightfully yours for the sake of others. 
and there is no obligation to go the extra mile by using some of what is rightfully yours for the sake of others. So even if by chance you escape contracting iopsia so that you can see the need of others, your response need only go as far as you feel necessary without encroaching on what is rightfully yours and only after you have used what is rightfully yours to first satisfy your obligation to you. Deritis is brought on by an inflamed sense of self-entitlement. And what it does, it whittles away at your sense of responsibility for others. So how will we all know when deritis, a narrowing constriction preventing acts of service brought on by an inflamed sense of self-entitlement has taken hold of us? We will know by examining how much of what is rightfully ours we are willing to sacrifice for others. But it would be wrong of me to leave it there. Is there an antidote for deritis? That narrowing constriction preventing acts of service brought on by an inflamed sense of self-entitlement? Yes, it is the repeated rubbing in of the concept of the best interest. As a society, we counteract the impact of self-centeredness of, 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 sorry, as a society, we counteract the, the impact of self-entitlement by constantly rubbing in the idea of acting in the best interest of all, recognizing that actions taken in the best interest of all are also actions taken in the best interest of yourself. So we must become assertive about recognizing and digging up the virtue of considerateness so that it becomes second nature to everybody, to you, me, everybody. Considerateness makes you willing to sacrifice some of your rights for the sake of the best interest, knowing that it also includes your interest. Constant exposure to the concept of the best interest for all heightens our sense of responsibility for others and therefore counteracts the spread of deritis. So, as my newly recruited agents of change to operation service restoration, I am asking you to be on the lookout for ailment number two which is spreading throughout our society. And that ailment is deritis, a narrowing constriction preventing acts of service brought on by an inflamed sense of self-entitlement. Self-entitlement diminishes our sense of responsibility for others by allowing self-indulgent living to replace self-giving service. Watch out for deritis. Lastly, ailment number three. We'd only have to look out for iopsia, a gradual blinding to the need for service brought on by the increasing spread of self-centeredness. And we'd only have to look out for deritis a narrowing constriction preventing acts of service brought on by an inflamed sense of self-entitlement. But you know what we have to look out for and we have to be equally vigilant about? It's ailment number three. And ailment number three is condescendomania. A delusion about the purpose of service brought on by exaggerated self-importance. Condescendomania. Recall what I've suggested already, that there is an unmistakable rise in both self-centeredness and self-entitlement in society, both of which are negatively impacting self-giving service. Add one more to that. There is an unmistakable rise in the ethos of self-importance 
And that too is negatively impacting self-giving service. The exponential rise in self-importance is being fueled by particular ideologies of hierarchism, which link status and standing with acquisition. So acquisition of wealth, fame, titles, power, or even multiple partners. Don't we hear now more and more statements like, I wonder if they really know who they are dealing with? Or do they know that I know so-and-so? Or one I heard recently, back off, you don't have what to step to me. I give you one last example of the reinforcing messages. Check the Managyalis top Yalis lyrics of Tommy Lee. I hope I said that right. Or at least the parts of those limits fit for airplay. Yeah. They go like this. Me under semi me at the CEO de Don. 30 model want, and I'm going to paraphrase here, to be with me like a fan. True me step out clear in a bare name brand, ice pan me neck, data drip pan me hand. Me a gallus, top gallus. <laughs> There's an unmistakable prevalence of thought that links being important with what you have acquired. No blurry lines with this one. Repeated exposure to this ethos eventually leads to an exaggerated sense of self-importance. And it is exaggerated self-importance that is the enemy of self-giving service. To be clear, exaggerated self-importance is what makes you think you don't have to join the long line at the tax office. So you walk past everybody who has waited for two and a half hours to just reach the front door with the expectation you will be let in. You can tell I had a recent experience. Exaggerated self-importance is what makes you feel slighted if people don't acknowledge you when you come into a room or single you out by name in the welcome at a function. And it's exaggerated self-importance is what makes you proclaim that people are ungrateful for not recognizing the privilege they enjoy by having you a superstar living in their country and not talking about anybody. An exaggerated perception of one's importance convinces you that there is a distinction to be made between you and the rest of the masses. And therein lies the danger to self-giving service. In fact, I want to argue my scientific concept is right that this may be the most damaging of all three ailments, as it doesn't prevent you from seeing the need. And you may even be willing to use what's rightfully yours to respond to the need, but only if it is clear that it is you who is meeting the need. The purpose of your self-giving is not about the receiver's need being met, but rather about you being the source to meet the need. The act of service then is a means to the end of further feeding into your perceptions of self-importance. When the reason for service is self-serving, condescendomania, a delusion about the purpose of service brought on by exaggerated self-importance has set in. Self-serving service has some telltale signs and let me just quickly tell you them. It is service that one dictates the conditions under which the act of service must occur with a few lights and probably a number more cameras and definitely an oversized check. It is self-serving service exaggerates even the simplest gesture so that they are colossal acts and even acts of service fulfilling basic needs that really should have been met in the first place as are branded as major acts of philanthropy. It is service, this kind of service also discriminates 
by deciding when the service can occur. It must be at my convenience. And who is to be served, whomever or whatever will illustrate the biggest bang for the book being donated. It is obstinate service that many times arrogantly presumes to know the best interest of the receiver without ever consulting them. And it is service meant to ingratiate by labeling the receiver as watch that all ungrateful, look what I did for him, and the act goes unacknowledged, and especially if the act is not reciprocated. In the end, it is patronizing service, as there is no identification with the receiving person or object of the service. Put another way, condescendomania brought on by exaggerated self-importance whittles away at a sense of solidarity with others. So how will we know when condescendomania, that delusion about the, pur the purpose of service brought on by exaggerated self-importance has taken hold of us? We will know it by examining what accoutrements our side men have to accompany us when giving service. But it would be wrong of me to leave this last one there. Is there an antidote to condescendomania? That delusion about the purpose of service brought on by exaggerated self importance? Yes, it is this regular group therapy. <laughs> that is regularly identifying with societal groups outside of the hierarchical bracket that you place yourself in or you find yourself in. And of course, doing this identification without cameras present. This allows for a reorientation of the mind around the concept of collective or our interest. As a society, we counteract the impact of exaggerated self-importance by being assertive about recognizing and promoting the virtue of humility so that it becomes second nature to everybody. Humility replaces self-interest with collective or our interest and allows for genuine connection with people. Constant reorientation around the idea of our interest heightens our feelings of solidarity with others and therefore counteracts the spread of condescendomania. So last time, as my newly recruited agents of change to operation service restoration, I am asking you also to be on the lookout for ailment number three spreading throughout our society, namely condescendomania, a delusion about the purpose of service brought on by exaggerated self-importance. Condescendomania diminishes our sense of solidarity with others by allowing self-serving living to replace self-giving service. Watch out for condescendomania. So let me wrap it all up then. What am, I, what am I saying? I'm saying this. There is a grave need in our society today to restore self-giving service to its rightful place in nation building. But to do so, we have to counteract some things which may seem to be on the rise in society. I call them ailments. Iopsia, deritis, and condescendomania. But really, these names only point to the rise of self-centeredness, self-entitlement, and self-importance. These IDC ailments whittle away at things in us needed for self-giving service, namely a sensitivity to others, a feeling of responsibility for others and the willingness to stand in solidarity with others. How do we counteract the IDC ailments? By giving primacy to generosity, considerateness, and humility. In other words, by reinforcing the OBO principles, reinforcing the concept of others' interest, the best interest, and collectively, our interest. So we restore self-giving service by replacing the IDC ailments with the OBO principles. So now do you see the link to the title? 
Well, if you said yes, not quite. It's almost the link, but not quite. I am under no misconception that you are going to remember my IDC ailments or OBO principles. But if tomorrow someone asks you, students, Ms. Baston, Ms. Stewart, what did that man speak about at the Founders Day lecture? Tell them this. He said that the enemy of service is an I don't care attitude. When I don't care about anything but myself, that's iopsia or self-centeredness. Or when I don't care because it's my right, that's the rightitis or self-entitlement. Or when I don't care really unless I get something out of it, that's condescendomania or, or self-importance, then self-giving service suffers. I don't care is the enemy of self-giving service. For self-giving service then to, to flourish in our society, which is operation, service restoration, we have to replace the growing I don't care attitude with an on behalf of attitude. That is, we have to adopt an approach to living where we do things on behalf of others. Living on behalf of others is key to restoring self-giving service to its place of primacy in society. And that then takes me right back to the beginning. In the end, doing this lecture was important because Archbishop Samuel Carter's life and work embodied the common good or living on behalf of others. Let us follow his lead and restore self-giving service to its rightful place in society. Let's start the process by changing the lingo from IDC to OBO. Thank you. I don't know if thank you suffices, but thank you for that wonderful lecture. I don't even call it a lecture, a motivational speech perhaps, inspirational, funny, interesting, just like the graduation speech a few months ago. I'm gonna invite you to join me here, Professor Taylor, and I have been monitoring the Slido and I'm extremely proud of everybody. You're doing very well with the Slido. What I need you to do is stop sending so many questions and start voting up the questions so I can see which are the ones that you want me to ask first. And of course, you know, I'm gonna sneak some of my own questions in there. Um, Mr. Hibber, should I take this mic with me or the other one? Take this one. Okay, so while I'm giving everybody a chance to go to slido.com event code campion, I'm going to put my first question in. So I had the pleasure and privilege of being at the graduation and hearing your previous speech, which was also three things that you wanted to leave with the audience. And if I remember correctly, it was get the glass of water, hold on to the cup. I don't remember the third one, I'm going to confess. But so the, the, what, the, what I, I feel like this is, that was be more selfless 101. And I feel like I'm in the graduate course here. <laughs> Share with us what's led you to be thinking along these lines, because clearly this is something that is preoccupying you in a good or bad way, which, whichever it is, I could see it from both ways. And I think everybody would love to know, why are you thinking that this is so important right now? 
All right, so let me begin by saying this is totally out of my area of expertise. Yes, as I, as I told you in the beginning, you know, I'm a climate scientist, but I think, you know, so forgive me if I can't answer many of your questions that you are going to, to tell me. The third one was click again, think again before you click send. But really, I think I laid it out in the lecture. I think what is worrying me is the state of our society and the things that we're giving primacy to, you know, things that we're holding up as priority and the people that we're holding up as the examples, you know, you know, and I, I was trying to allude, allude to it in all, in all of these things, you know, we're holding up, you know, values, well, not even values, we're holding up materialism and you know, and, and the whole idea of, you know, as alluding to it, hierarchism that links status with, with materialism, you know. If you look on society today and, you know, just as, a, and I'm just a casual observer, I have no expertise in this area, you do tend to worry. And the question is, is all that we can do worry? Well, maybe it's not. Maybe you can begin to try to apply your way of thinking, your scientific way of thinking to see if we can get people to recognize that we cannot keep continuing down on this path. So. So I won't completely abuse my privileges. I will go to the question, which has 12 upvotes. So I can't ignore it. And it's a tough one. I'm not, it's not mine. So don't blame me. Jada is asking, can deritis be linked in any way to capitalism since companies and even people act in the interest of profit at the expense of others or at the expense of the best interest? So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to try to explain every aspect of the lecture, lecture, but I think Jada is moving right along in the, in the right direction. You know, when your motivation is what's your interest and not the best interest, that's what I am entitling as deritis. And that's one of the things that I think we really just have to watch out for. So, so maybe just to go along there then is to say that what I'm trying to say, it's not just for the individual, it's also for the individual in the workplace. It's also for the company. It's also for governments to think about how they are doing and we move along and we move right along, sorry. I hope you heard what he said because it was actually quite meaningful. So in a way you answered this before, but this question, which is also quite popular, is trying to link your interest in service to your other work, which we thought we were going to come here and hear about. And the question, as she has put it, it Ms. Simone Walters, is was a research into service fueled by the need to change minds before any meaningful work on climate change can begin? Yes. And and, and I hope, and I was trying to allude to it in the lecture, but that's for my other lecture <laughs> next time. The solution to climate change really will require us to think about the other. You know, if you think about things that are climate change related, the only way we are going to reduce where we are heading for, and we, we are heading for a bad place, is what we call, and I'll throw in a little science since you allowed me to throw in a little science. <laughs> is when we, for example, think about mitigation. And what is mitigation in climate change? It's reducing the greenhouse gases that cause the problem in the first place. Well, where do those greenhouse gases come from? Well, it's all those big, I think I mentioned it, those big gas guzzling cars that you have. It's industries that put out the greenhouse gases. In other words, it's only going to begin to solve the problem when people start to have a sacrificial and simple way of living. You know, something I learned all a long time ago, you know, live simply so others can simply live. And I credit my father, it's not me, <laughs> right? Um, but it requires you to think about others. And then if you think about the other side of climate change, which is, okay, we have committed ourselves to some climate change, well, what does that mean? Well, boy, when climate change happens, it's the most vulnerable who feel it first and who feel it worst. And so if that is true, then we also have to be, begin to think about how can I give up some of what is rightfully mine to help those most vulnerable? So there's a clear linkage between what I do as, as a scientist and the area I study and the concepts. Uh 
person hasn't said who they are another tough question not mm -hmm. mine mine are still in my pocket waiting <laughs> to come out the philosopher michael sandal speaks of an ethos similar to derititis but argues that it's an unintended consequence of meritocracy your thoughts wow <laughs> All right. As I said, I'm completely out of my field of, of reference here. So I don't know if I really want to venture venture on that. But I think the right title, without answering that question, um, can come about due to a number, a number of ways. I think I was trying to argue about some here, you know. Um, when you 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 move across that blurry line um, between entitlement and self-entitlement. So without knowing too much, because that's not my area of philosophy, it is quite possible that the right itis could be do emerge out of the way there. So it doesn't always have to be intentional. It can be in, un, unintentional, but even in the unintentional, it might be due to another issue which really should have taken people and others into account. And I think that might have been implied in that question, but not straying too far out of my field. To what extent would you agree, and I'm interested to hear your perspective as a fellow parent, to what extent would you agree that inherent human laziness is a cause of all three ailments, since it is easy to be self-centered or refuse to sacrifice rights? And if I may just stick in, I'm reminded of get the glass of water and hold on to the cup. Right. Well, then I think you have <laughs> gone down the road to, to answer it. Um, and maybe what they're referring to as inherent human laziness is also an unwillingness to inconvenience yourself, really. Um, you know, I'm, and you know, you can get me in trouble and I can't, I can't go home. So I, this has nothing to do with my, my children. But this is the idea that, you know, I'm lying in the bed and, and I can't bother even though you hear the need or you see the need, you know. Um, is, is the can't in bother to inconvenience myself. And I don't have to either. I think I'm alluding to it here because there's nothing wrong with lying in your bed and there's nothing, you know, illegal or there's nothing to force you to, you know, so, yeah. Well, if my son who happens to be here hears that, I would like you to take note. Oh. <laughs> I can still go home. You, you, you can't say it, but I can. Well, I never said it was a trend in your dream of any of any of my children, right? So, how can we, as Campion students, this one is anonymous, and alumni serve with OBO? What can we do to create that culture of genuine connection? And I think Campion is doing a lot of that. You know, I think you know. I, just in some of the clubs that I know that they have and that they are there as for students, they present an opportunity for every day or every week for you to have the OBO things. I think it's also in the kind of teaching that they that you delivered, and that is a formal teaching, but even the informal teaching, the examples set by the teachers, you know, Mrs. Baston and Stuart. Well, I just you know, the, the, the devotionals, the, the thing. So it, it's there as it's there already, you know. And 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 then you when you are students hear that and you would take that, take that and manifest it and carry on. You know, I if I just and and if I use my daughter as an example here, the kind of ways I see her when she comes home from school, thinking of ways to collect things for other people or you know be involved in the, the this collection or that cake drive for thing i think companies are already inculcating those things and what i was trying to argue is we have to be consistent and assertive about it because the competing messages are doing a great job if i can say that you know and so they see it on the TikTok and they listen to it in the music we have to counteract that and we have to be deliberate and assertive and campion is is one of the places doing a good job with that i hope this is the last one <laughs> oh no <laughs> we have we have quite a few more and there are they're being voted up again for those of you who didn't catch it slido.com event code capri okay yes oh I, i'm being given instruction sorry campion 
Sorry, I'm so used to saying that it's and it's we borrowed it from Capri for tonight's use. Uh, that's why that's that's my excuse. Um, so the, here's where I'm going to tie in my own kind of recurring thought as I listen. So Jada asks, Jada again, good questions. Is service done out of enlightened self-interest or condescendomania inherently bad, even though the goals of service helping others, etc., are being achieved? And I'll tack on to that, that maybe this is complicating it a bit, but I thought about kind of the risk of encouraging virtue signaling through the promotion of, of, of encouraging people to do more service, which is something that I find particularly disturbing, where people are promoting them, are, are quote unquote, doing good things as a matter, as an act of self-promotion. Right, right. And, and so you'll be, you know, every time I gave you one of these things, I pointed to the virtue that we must make sure is emerging through both the messaging and the acts of service. So I pointed you to generosity, you know, that, that so that the motive comes out of seeing the need and needing to be generous and wanting to be generous. It that pointed you to considerateness and I pointed you to doing things hum with humility. So once we begin to reinforce these qualities and these attributes, then what, what you are doing is almost trying, making sure that the kind of service you offer becomes this genuine self-giving, you know, um, and, and, and therefore, you know, the service is meaningful. It, it, is, it is touching lives. It is making a difference to the environment. So we have to watch for those virtues in the, in the service that is being offered. So this one is not at the top, but I'm going to use my privilege to ask this because I'm genuinely interested in this. And I think this is something that, you know, when you started out, a lot of us, I imagine as I did, recognized exactly what you're talking about with iitis, itopia. <laughs> Iopsia. Iopsia, Iopsia. And so can she ask the question, how would you differentiate self-centeredness from self-compassion? <laughs> All right. And, and I think, again, I try to be clear, say, say that, you know, I, I, you know, there's this blurry line that can be, you know, so, and I try very hard to say that self-care and self-compassion is a good thing. You know, there is a role and a place for that, you know, because you must look after yourself, you know, and so I am not saying anything about, about that. However, when it crosses that blurry line and when it crosses that blurry line now it's it moves as i was saying from just being self-care to self-prioritization so you put yourself over and above anything else so you don't even have others interests on par with your interest the other interests gets left behind and so i was saying when you begin to see that happening and you know it is happening as they're trying to give you give the thing because you're beginning to realize, you catch yourself, you're not in seeing the need at all, you know, then that's, that's a distinction. But I'm not in any way arguing against, you know, self-care and that. That's important. But what we must carefully, don't make it morph into, it's all about me and, and at the expense of even including the other. Okay, so for the last question, and I'm running a slight risk of repeating the question, so I'm going to invite you to use this last answer to bring in as much science as you want, as much climate as you want, which is how much of the three IDC do you believe is tied to the human nature of survival above everything else? Wow. <laughs> um, I don't know how to answer the how much, um, but, I, but I would say that there is some element of, of that, that does tie to the want to survive and, and grasping to survival. So um, definitely you can, you can make that kind of connection, you know, and, and I suppose what I really want, you know, 
in the climate sphere, after a while, when you are deprived so much, you will sometimes, you know, put aside what is, is there to reach for what you need, you know, but we don't want to reach that, that, kind of, that kind of point. I think, you know, just to end, what I am trying so hard, I think, to try to say is there's a lot of us trying to look after us, prioritize ourselves. There's a lot of us trying to make sure we use our rights, you know, say it's, it's our rights. There is so much about us trying to say, listen, if I get this itself, you know, important. And, I, and that just pervades the society today. I see it in the climate world. We all see it around us. And I try to give these, these examples. I just try to say, watch. Let us stop and watch that. So if survival is what motivates that, watch it. If it is for another reason that motivates, let's watch that because that leads us down a slippery path and a slippery slope. And it leads that slippery slope eventually you know, allows us to others. I am asking us just to change the lingo from IDC to OBO, from I don't care, it's all about me to on behalf of. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm not giving the vote of thanks, but I do have to say, Michael, thank you for sharing your heart and your mind with us. I think we are all better people for it. I'd like to invite Brianna to come and give the vote of thanks. I think you can use that, Michael. Ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant good evening to you all. As we celebrate our first in-person Founders Week since the pandemic began, it is indeed a great blessing that we are able to gather here and celebrate the vivacity and richness of our Campion family. I am pleased to present the vote of thanks on this enriching occasion in honor of our first principal, Archbishop Samuel Carter. I'd first like to give glory to the Almighty God for allowing this event to be a great success. To our beloved principal, Mrs. Grace Baston, chairman of the board, Mr. Anton Thompson, and vice principals, Ms. Catherine Stewart and Mr. David Henry. As always, we thank you for facilitating this event and representing the administration that keeps our school running in fine style. Most Reverend Kenneth Richards, we thank you for your beautiful prayer that indeed ensured that our event was centered around and guided by the Almighty, hence allowing it to positively impact all of us here today. To our musical team led by Ms. Karen Armstrong and our technical team led by Mr. Anil Hibbert, we extend our gratitude for helping to ensure that today's proceedings were smooth and indeed lifted our spirits. Ambassador Alun Ndombe Asamba, we'd like to thank you for being here and representing the Archbishop Samuel Carter Foundation. Thank you for reminding us of the significance of his legacy to us as Campionites. At this time, I'd like to invite Ryan to present you with a small token of our appreciation. Matthew. <laughs> Thank you very much. Dr. Diana Thorburn, we extend our deepest gratitude to you for moderating this event with such grace and representing our alumni so well. 
We'd also like to give you a small gift to show our appreciation. <laughs> Mrs. Caroline Mafood or Master Organizer. We'd like to thank you for always being there for the Campion community and facilitating this event that truly enriched our community and allowed us to grow together, the true goal of any strong family. Here is a token of our appreciation for all your efforts. We extend our deepest gratitude to our guest speaker, Professor Michael Taylor, for enlisting us in his service restoration campaign. Thank you for reminding us of the importance of self-giving service and highlighting our society's most prevalent ailments, hyposia, deritis, and condescendomania, while encouraging us to indeed shift from IDC to OBO. Mr. Taylor, your charisma and expert advice, I'm sure, have had a lasting effect on us. The Campion community sincerely thanks you for your enthusiasm and encouragement. It is indeed the spirit of giving and enlightening that stands as the foundation of our great school. We'd like to present this gift to you as a token of our immense, immense gratitude. Thank you very much. And lastly, thank you all for attending, especially to our special guests and alumni who went out of their way to be here today. I hope that you have absorbed the gifts of wisdom that were shared by Professor Taylor and always remember to put service above all, the true way of the Campionite. Is it not real?
Thank you. 